there's quite a lot of buzz going on around Otto's new cloud rendering uh, service called RNDR. I've tested a couple of quite complex scenes on this platform and uh, results are impressive. The only complication in this workflow is that your scene has to be fully baked into Orbx file. And most of the times, uh, things like particles, for example, needs additional treatment prior rendering on the cloud. Let's talk about this. The way RNDR works is quite straightforward from user's perspective. RNDR is your bridge to access unlimited amount of GPUs available from network participants. Once RBX file is uploaded, all your frames are distributed through a lot of machines and are rendered at once. Like a deadline render manager. And network participants are artists just like you who are not currently using their machine. When you're not using your machine, let it render for the network and the network will render for you later when you need it. Win-win scenario. While you let your machine render for the network, it accumulates credits that you can use later to render your scenes. The pricing for rendering on RNDR is the most interesting part for me personally. Just to have some context behind my words, let's have a look at a couple of case studies I rendered on RNDR, like a test. It's worth mentioning that all the works I'm publishing on my channel are usually not bigger than full HD. But for this test specifically, I uh, rendered these works in 4K on the service. So they are four times bigger resolution and approximately four times longer render times, but could be longer. This one is the simplest one. Nothing really going on. We have fancy camera moves and fairly simple shaders but they require a lot of samples to render clean. This scene represents the kind of work we all do on a regular basis. Let's see how long such frame in 4K takes uh, to render on my workstation with two Titan RTX GPUs. The settings are obviously the same that I'll be using on RNDR. The reason I need uh, so many samples is because certain parts of the image would not be resolved with lower samples. So this frame takes 40 minutes to render on my single station. It would take 500 hours or 20 days to render on a single machine. And it took one night to render on RNDR. 750 frames, all nine shots, in 4K, 5000 samples, path tracing, and I used tier 2, which is kind of the priority one. The renders would go faster on this one. And it did cost me 1900 credits, which equals approximately $480. There are three tiers available on the service. Tier 2 is the fastest one at the reasonable price. Uh, tier 3 is the most affordable one, but much slower. And then there's also Tier 1, which is not yet available. As far as I know, they plan to build like uh, trusted uh, render nodes for that tier or data center. It's not yet clear what this means and what it will mean. Maybe some kind of safety protocols for movie studios or maybe high-end fail-proof machines or something like that. Speaking of safety, no one will ever be able to see what you send to network. All the assets you upload to the network are encrypted and the final frames are encrypted too on the GPU directly. So I wouldn't be worried about that. Anyways, back to the first case study. I've also ran uh, the same render in full HD just to find out the cost. And it was 315 credits, which is about $80 on the tier three, which is an economy solution. So here you have your uh, range of prices for RNDR service. It's extremely affordable if you are familiar with other render uh, forms. And I also know that you can get the credits four times cheaper uh, through cryptocurrency. I have little to no knowledge about that crypto stuff, so I'll skip this part, but encourage you to 
go and find more in for yourself. Another case study I, I did was a bit more complex. This one has a moving rigged creature, hair, dynamics, and the spider web and particles. I've rendered this to test what can actually be baked into Orbx file. Everything apparently. I overcranked the samples on this one just to get the cleanest image possible. It was clean enough at 2048 samples, but I did 4096 just because I could. This did cost 2300 uh, render credits, uh, which equals around $575. Can easily divide this by two because, as I mentioned, I could do it with 2048 samples uh, and the image would look clean. And it took one night to render as well. So these two case studies hopefully are giving you a better understanding of R&DR pricing and reassures you that it can handle anything. You just need to know how to use it in full. And for this, you have me. It's time to mention that this video is sponsored by Otoy, specifically with the purpose to show you how to bake complicated stuff into Orbx and render on R&DR. For the educational purposes, we will use the spider scene. We need to bake this into Orbx, uh, preserving all the dynamics, hair, movements, everything. And what's more important, keep all the particles. And I modified the scene we will be looking at and made it a little bit more interesting by introducing color into particles, specifically to show you how to bake attributes into the particles. So yeah, here's my scene. Uh, I will quickly go into emitter and this is what I meant. I introduced some really obvious color, black and red, to show you uh, how to preserve the color in the baked Alembic. Let me play it through. This doesn't look like my color. Let me quickly recache this. Whoop! I wish this actually would be that fast in real life. I sped it up, obviously. <laughs> you can see the quite obvious color variation from red to black. Let's quickly render this. I will disable my render passes to speed up things. And here I have blue and yellow because I remapped the colors. Here it is. Instance color node uh, with source set to particles and emitter set as uh, color source. So as I was baking display color, I'm set selecting this as uh, my color mode. And then this goes to gradient where I can change the colors as I wish without needing to recache the whole simulation. And then emitter have an octane object tag. It recognizes the particles and particles set to ge geometry. And geometry is just a sphere, a low polygonal and with the shader we just saw assigned to it. So there's that. Let's get to baking part. So usually what you would do, you would right click, go to bake alembic and hope that all your stuff would get baked. I'll speed this up for you. That's the folder where my alembic was saved to. And as you can see, the size is two kilobytes. I don't think anything is in there, but let's check. Let's create a new scene drag our alembic there, select it as uh, particles as polygonal objects and nothing, it's empty. Okay, let's, let's import it in a different way because you could import like thinking particles and nothing, nothing in there. This is a good example why I prefer Houdini for such things. I don't know, either X particles or Cinema 4D, they just don't want to work that way. In order to bake X particles natively, you would need to create a generator with uh, actual geometry in it and then bake that. Only that way it would save the information about particles. Uh, but doing actual geometry uh, caching with almost 100,000 particles inside of Cinema 4D is a killer. For this simple simulation, it would take a couple of hours. I don't want to wait that long. Good news is that Houdini is available for free. Apprentice license is for free and it doesn't limit you in anything. You just can't use it commercially. 
So I encourage you guys to start using Houdini for even small tasks like that. Let's assume you already downloaded Houdini. Xparticles is able to cache BGO files, which are native to Houdini. So in my cache object, I'll select that. I'll specify where I want it to be saved. You have a really convenient thing called record data there. If you would choose custom, it would allow you to select attributes that you want to bake into these files. So I'll say velocity, color, display just in case. Let's also save ID and magically fast do the cache. Let's launch Houdini. If you would have apprentice license, you would have Houdini apprentice written. You need to perform literally a couple of steps in Houdini. That's it. Not nothing complicated. You're just using Houdini power to kind of transcode your particles. So we will drop a geo node, uh, then load the file, specify where our BGO files are, and that's it. You have your particles. But in order to read uh, color attributes, you obviously need to tell Houdini what to look for. The simplest way to read colors are with color node. And we want the color to come from the attribute. Let's select our color type, set it to ramp from attribute and select color as our attribute. That's it. Now you can remap it slightly, recolor it if you wish. And that's it. Now you need to bake it back to Alembic that Cinema 4D can read. Uh, just drop uh, Alembic ROP and specify where you want it to be saved. Set the frame range and click save to disk. And I won't be speeding this up. You can see how fast the process is. So literally three steps and you're done. Let's get back to cinema and import our Alembic from Houdini. So this one was two kilobytes and the new one is almost one gig. There is a difference. We can disable our X particles now in cinema. Let's just do it in a new scene for a moment. Okay, I want to import it as polygon objects. Here you go. All your particles, perfect, with colors, attributes baked into Alembic is a big deal, guys. Took me a while to figure that out and I couldn't find a lot of info about this. Cut this Alembic and put it in our original scene. And if I'll play this through, there's our spider, uh, but no particles. It's because Cinema 4D works in centimeters, but, uh, but Houdini works in meters. Let's set this to meters. Let's play this through now. By some reason, uh, the particles are walking in the opposite direction from the spider. I won't be wasting time in trying to figure out what causes that glitch. I'll just go to Houdini and modify the Alembic. So I'll drop the transform node and just flip the Z axis. Let's quickly rebake this. We remember that it's quite fast. So yeah, that's done. I'll re-import my Alembic and here we go. Now the particles are perfectly aligned, have all the attributes perfectly baked and ready to go. But if I'll click render, they don't show up in the renderer, obviously. And the thing about Octane is that unfortunately it doesn't, the, if you would assign object tag to this Alembic, it won't recognize particles. Took me a while to realize that what does recognize uh, particles is Octane's scatter object, which is notorious for its ability to handle really, really uh, big amounts of geometry. It's a perfect instancing tool. Why don't we do that? Drop a octane scatter object, put our sphere underneath it, set the source to our alembic particles. By default, your clones will be distributed on vertices. And here we go. You have your particles rendering from alembic. How cool is that? One last thing to sort about these particles uh, is color. Let's go to our shader, get rid of that instance color node. Let's drop a new one, set it to particles. And as a source, instead of emitter, let's drop that vertex color tag. 
which clearly states it's a CD attribute from Houdini, the color that we extracted there. Drop it here, connect our instance node to gradient, boom, here you go guys. You have color in your alembic particles. Life will never be the same again. Great stuff, we can change the colors in the gradient, do whatever we want. Okay, this is it for particles. Let's bake the rest of the scene. All these elements are quite straightforward. They don't need any special, special treatment. Just uh, I'll start from bottom up. So I'll bake all the water drops on the, on the spider web first. Then I'll draw, then I'll bake spider web and then the spider. So right click on water drops, bake alembic. Once done, it will appear in your hierarchy. Just drag all necessary tags and materials on it. In my case, it's water shader and object tag. I will do the same with the second set of water drops. Drag materials and tags, delete it, delete the original. And then the spider web, done. Drag the tag and material. And I won't be deleting the spider web yet because my spider needs to know the plane on which it walks. I will bait the spider a bit differently because it's a really complex character. So I found that there is a difference uh, in baking Alembic by clicking right click, bake Alembic, or going to file, export Alembic because the second one offers you a lot more options to choose from. And as you can see in this spider, I have hair. I also have some vertex maps that I mapped to specify the opacity in my material. So I need all this data to be in there. Okay, go to file, export, alembic. And again, depending on what you're trying to bake, uh, you would need to play with these settings to get it right and experiment to ensure that all the data is baked. Save the spider, bring the spider back. Here it is, our spider, we see all the controls that are now baked. It's not procedural anymore. We can see we have hair, we have everything in there. And since now it's all baked, including spider web, water drops, the spider itself, particles, I can scrub through timeline without the need to simulate it all from the beginning, which is, which is the thing I like a lot. Just a few additional steps to, to make our spider look like original one. I will just quickly transfer all my shaders back. So that's the body material, that's the material for the eyes, and I need a selection for it. So this one is for eyes. Select that material, drop that selection to eyes. And here's my opacity vertex map. I need to update my material. Go to node editor and just update the vertex map. Okay, my hair, I'll just drop because it's not uh, Cinemas 4D's native hair anymore. I'll drop an octane tag and then hair, I'll specify the thickness. I already know what thickness I need from my pre previous experiments. So I'll just quickly clone this uh, object tag over other hair objects, which are now splines, by the way. That's done, we can delete our original spider. Now everything is truly baked. Let's render it to ensure everything works and looks correctly. Yay, looks fine to me. Now this is ready to go on r and &R. This one is ready to be baked into Orbix. And the reason I chose this scene with the spider is because it has almost all the kind of complex elements you would ever need. It has simulation and particles, could be whatever, uh, well, there is no problem with VDBs or anything like that, but liquids, maybe you would want to bake those into Alembic. It's a pretty complex character in here, rigged, really complex kind of creature. It's uh, dynamics, Cinema 4D dynamics. And uh, yeah, it's pretty much anything you would ever need to bake. And this scene proves that it can be done in Orbix and rendered on r and I mean, possibilities are endless with this. 
Okay, so let's actually bake an RBX file and move forward. So before you do that, you want to check all your settings, resolution and uh, frame range, all that kind of stuff is not really important at this stage. Uh, what is important is the camera that is selected. Make sure it's the right one because RBX only uh, bakes one camera into one file, unfortunately, at this stage. So make sure you, your camera is selected. Make sure all the passes you need are selected as you need them and all other Octane settings like uh, render buffer, what is it, ACES, whatever, float, float linear, all set. Go to Octane dialog, file, export. Make sure you're selecting animated package or BX. Only this way you are able to bake animation. While it's baking, I'll just skip to when it when it's finished because this process can take a bit of time. Once the process of baking is done, you will have one convenient file in your destination folder. That this is RBX file. Before submitting it anywhere, you need to really double check that it works correctly in Octane standalone. If it works fine in Octane standalone, then it will this is exactly how it will render on, on the network. Drag your RBX into standalone. And usually the lists are enormous. The node lists, I mean, it's tremendous. So just zoom out, navigate through that little window on the left. This is your target node. This is what's called target node. Select it, and once selected, standalone will start rendering for you. So what you need to do, apart from ensuring that the look is correct, is scrub through timeline and make sure that the animation is correct. So that's exactly what I'm doing here. Everything looks fine to me. The spider is animated, particles are animated, camera is animated, all good. All my passes are fine. This now is good to go on the network. Another thing I want to mention is that depending Depending on your scene, RBX file can be tremendously big because of all the geometry textures, whatever you have in there. In my case, it's not that bad, it's reasonable, but what's good about RBX files is that they are very well compressed. Why don't we do that? Let's uh, compress this into zip archive. Okay. And we see that from three gigs, we went to 900 megabytes. I mean, that's a big difference. With, you know, English internet, I would much more prefer to upload 900 megabytes than three gigs. And uh, sometimes there are scenes that are 40 gigs in size that can be compressed to like something like 10 or 15 gigs, which is much more reasonable than uploading that enormous amount of data. Let's go to the network, gentlemen. So as you can see, yeah, I did a lot of tests in here. All you need to do is to drop your zip archive into upload section. And here it goes. It, of course, I sped it up. British internet is not that cool. Cool. And then it will take a bit of time to process your archive, you know, decompress it, prepare for rendering usually it doesn't take too long. So now our scene is ready and it's it offers you to create a new job. Let's do that. So render target is that node that you saw in, in, in standalone. It's actually your camera. You only have one choice if you bake the RBX from Cinema 4D. So that's irrelevant to, to us. Number of samples, you can change that if you wish. Resolution, let's go for Full HD on this one. I would choose a frame range of 60 to 150. You have some advanced options that allow you to manipulate your motion blur. That's a really specific, you know, option. And then you need to, out, uh, to add your output. So it will be EXR 32 bits, uh, DWAA compression, just to save some space. And it's a multi-layer file, obviously. And then you need to specify how your files will be named. I always go with custom text because I don't like that long name, you know? So custom text, I want it to be called cam1 
because that's the camera that we baked into Orbix. So now we see it's Cam One Beauty 001 EXR, but I don't know, don't need that Beauty because it's multi-layer file. So I'll delete, I'll delete all unnecessary fields. So Cam One and frame number, that looks perfect. You can add more outputs if you need, but I won't. Now it's time to select the tier you want to render with. I usually go with tier 2 priority. And as I mentioned earlier, tier 1 trusted partners is coming soon. It's not available yet. And here you can select what how you want to pay for 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 the rendering. And then you have a frame approval method. I always leave that at manual review because sometimes rarely but nodes fail to render your scene properly and then you can submit it for review and re-render and if it, that, that would be set for pre-approved frames then you would need to create a new job unfortunately. And then you need to generate an estimate in order to submit the job. The way you do that is you need to know the Octane Bench score for your machine. Uh, let's quickly do this. So Octane Bench just download it from AutoAce website, run it and by the end of and by the end of the process, it will show you what's the score of your machine. So I'll enter this data in this field, 620. And then I know that my frame took uh, two minutes to render on this machine. So that's good. Let's submit the job. So here you can see all the settings that you selected. You can see that uh, you can see all the passes that will be rendered for you. Frame range, FPS, resolution, all that good stuff. And then once uh, render nodes are allocated, the rendering starts and it's a pretty satisfying process. Obviously for the purpose of this video, I sped it up to make it even more satisfying. But this is pretty much uh, how Deadline works within our studio. All the nodes are rendering all your frames at the same time. It, it doesn't work like network rendering in Octane. You can uh, quickly scrub through your frames and see the preview of your animation. Make sure that all the frames are correct. Once job is done, you can see that 91 frames require review. This is when you can click download. And this is the last chance to Make sure all your frames are good and you're happy. Select all frames, accept selection. If there are frames that you're not happy with, you can select that frame and send it to re-render. Let's download the outputs. Select all, we want all frames. We had only one output and we want all passes. Download selected configuration. Unfortunately, at the moment, there is only one way to download all your frames and it's by changing some of your settings in, in your Chrome browser. So if you would go to settings, scroll all the way down and click advanced, you could see that you can select the, the default location of your downloads. Just create a new folder uh, called whatever you want. I'll create RNDR, select it, and then I will just uncheck this, ask where to save each file before downloading thing. What this will do is it will allow RNDR to queue the downloads for me. So yeah, if I'll click download all, it says exactly that, how to download all the frames. And if I'll click begin download, you can see how all my frames are now being downloaded. And this is it. Now you can open Fusion or whatever your post-production software is, load your frames and start comping. You see all the passes are there, they are super clean, they rendered in no time for a very, very reasonable price. To summarize guys, um, RNDR is the platform that changes my attitude towards render forms. The nature of the projects we're doing uh, commercially requires use of render forms from time to time. And when this thing will scale up, this will be epic. 
going forward, there will be more users, more network uh, participants bringing more render nodes to the network and everyone would be able to render scenes and no one ever dreamed about just because no one had that power. These days are in the past and the future is bright. I hope this tutorial clarified some things for you, I hope it encourages you to try your complex scenes on R&DR, and I wish you all the best. Happy rendering, gentlemen. Peace.